I'm so, so excited that the first version of my custom PCB finally works. First version, and uh, I took a long, long time to actually get all the fixes done to make it all work. It has some bodges and fixes, but now all the intended functions of this PCB works like this breadboard prototype. So in this video, I want to share how I went from this breadboard prototype containing an Arduino dev board connected to a few sensors and actuators, some LEDs into this custom PCB. Now, there are some design considerations to take note. For example, power management circuit or how to upload the bootloader and the firmware, LEDs, buttons or switches and integrate the various sensor circuits. Now, even though for today's video, I will be focusing on how to make custom PCBs, sometimes a breadboard might just be enough. Now, a breadboard can be useful for many different purposes. They can be useful for education, art project, or even deploying and testing one unit for a few days. So sometimes we might not even need to create a custom PCB. However, at other times, we might need multiple units or the components that we use can only be found in SMD packages or non-standard footprints that you have to use a custom PCB. In these cases, a custom PCB can be very, very handy along with the usefulness of it being much smaller and robust than a breadboard equivalent. So having considered the usefulness of both a breadboard and a custom PCB, let's dive into the first design consideration that is the microcontroller, the heart of our project. Now for my prototype, I have used Arduino Zero, which has the microcontroller SAM D21 by Atmel. If this is your first time trying to go from a breadboard with the dev board to a custom PCB, I highly, highly recommend referencing three other open source schematic designs with the same microcontroller as your breadboard. In my case, I refer to Adafruit's Feather Zero, Robodyne's M0 Mini, and Arduino Zero Board. All the three dev boards have open schematics with the same microcontroller SAMD21 that we can refer when designing our custom PCB. Also, don't forget to add the data sheet of the microcontroller itself. Now, because the microcontroller will be on the PCB, at the first stage, we should decide which package and variant of the microcontroller to use. Yes, it doesn't mean that this is SAMD21, there'll be only one SAMD21. I figured that there are plenty of packages, plenty of variants. Let's have a look at it. After checking out the ordering information from the data sheet, we should then go through the list of variants. There you see a long list of SAMD21. And thankfully, after referring to the three open source designs, I chose SAMD21G. 18A-AU with flash 256K and package type TQFP48, which is basically uh, the package TQFP with 48 pins. Be sure to also check for the availability and stock from the vendor for this exact package, especially before doing the PCB layout. In my case, I chose LCSC as the vendor. After confirming the brain of the project, which is basically the microcontroller in this case, the second design consideration is to look at the subsystem level design. So it is time to consolidate the entire breadboard prototype basically into different components. This will give us an overview on how various components or subsystems come together to make the entire breadboard prototype work. I like to use Draw.io website and sketch up a few quick flow charts and connect the subsystems. I also color code the boxes into three main areas, power, microcontroller, and sensors and actuators. Now that we have a flow chart with all the various components, this will come in handy when we design the schematics. Eventually, each of the boxes in the subsystem flowchart becomes a logical block in the schematics that will separate the major functional areas. For example, let's say this infrared emitter block eventually becomes a circuit component in the schematics. 
If this is our first version, first iteration of converting from a breadboard to a PCB, these logical blocks can also help us separate them by using either say solder jumpers or zero ohm resistors or resistors in general. For example, here is the symbol for an open solder jumper in KiCad. I have used this to isolate the power circuit and the temperature sensor circuit. Sometimes we can also use a zero ohm resistor or desolder a resistor. So when I populate the PCB for the first time, I leave out soldering these components and test each of the logical blocks one by one. So after we decide the microcontroller, the exact variant of the microcontroller, and then have an overview of the subsystem, the next most important thing is the power. We need to decide how are we going to power our PCB. Is it going to be a USB power, alkaline battery power, maybe a rechargeable LiPo battery, or even a coin cell. In my project, I decided to use both USB power and batteries. This also meant I needed a circuit that could switch the power source automatically if both power sources are used. So I found this part challenging, especially because if I did not have the power circuit correct, it has the potential to damage the entire PCB or even parts of the components and circuits. And unfortunately, this could not be verified on the breadboard. Well, maybe I could have soldered the micro USB and the battery, but for the purpose of easiness, it could not be verified because the dev board had its own power and a different power source than the one I intend to do in my PCB. The only way I could design this was to use some online research and schematic review and comments from friends. I also created a tiny circuit simulation to cross check the design in false start. So after deciding the power sources and then how to switch between them, the next important related power design consideration is the voltage regulator. I had to check the operating voltage of the microcontroller from the data sheet to ensure whatever values I chose, it should fit within this range. For SAM D21, the operating voltage is 1.6 to 3.6 volts. Based on the operating voltage, I chose the voltage regulator, which has an output of 2.8 volts. I also checked the maximum ratings of all important components in the project to ensure it is compatible with 2.8 volts. I usually have a table like this to list down all the maximum ratings or the operating voltages of each of the components. For example, for IR receiver, the infrared receiver that I'm using, the voltage range is from 2.5 to 5.5 volts. And the temperature sensor also has the operating voltage of 1.9 volts to 3.6 volts. We can create a power tree, which is defined in this Intel document as illustrating the main supply power flow through a tree of power converters that convert the main supply power to the voltage and current required to drive various loads. And this is how my simple power tree schematic looks like. You might consider putting in a power switch, which can come in handy either for debugging or general use case. Another component to add in is the reverse polarity protection. Now I went for the simplest one, which is adding a Schottky diode. When the voltages are inverted, the diode basically becomes an open circuit and this protects the components of the PCB. So when I had this PCB manufactured and delivered to me, I soldered all the components except for the open solder jumpers and some of the resistance so that I have the components of the circuit segregated. I tested with the USB power, looks all good. And then I tested the battery power, all fine too. And finally, I tested both the power sources simultaneously to ensure the switching circuit works. So that was a huge relief when I finally had the power management circuit working. And this means that I can power up rest of the circuit and see how it works. The next crucial design consideration is the bootloader. And for any custom PCB, uploading the bootloader is important because the microcontroller that we will be buying will highly likely come bare and without any bootloader uploaded. So because I'm using the Arduino firmware for my project, I had to ensure that the Arduino bootloader for Arduino Zero especially for microcontroller SAMD21G, is able to be uploaded 
onto my custom PCB right here. Now to upload the Arduino bootloader, it has to use the SWD interface, which is a two wire protocol with pins, SW clock and SWD IO. There are many ways of including these two pins, either as part of a standard 10 pin connector or just the essential pins pulled out along with the power and the reset pins. So this is a design decision we need to make for our custom PCB. Do ensure you have the reset circuit connected to the microcontroller that will be used not only for the bootloader uploading, but for general use case as well. So if this is the first time you're using a new microcontroller to upload the bootloader, it might take a bit of time. Well, at least it did for me because I had to figure out the pins, the connectors, and even the programmer or even creating the bootloader file that I could upload into my custom PCB. And to make things a little bit more challenging, I could not do this when I was doing the breadboard prototyping because after all, I only have one dev board with that specific microcontroller on board and I did not want to risk having a non-functional dev board by trying to experiment to keep uploading the bootloader. Mm, not for me. So this was something I could only do with my custom PCB. And the final design consideration, now that we have gone through the microcontroller, the power, the subsystem level design, and even the bootloader, are the sensor and the actuator circuits. So there might be a few of them. I refer to the data sheet of each of these components to get an idea of the reference application circuit. For example, here, the IR, the infrared receiver, had a couple of resistors and capacitors to reduce the supply ripple. And the temperature sensor data sheet also had a typical application circuit for reference. So I was like, this is the easiest part, right? The application circuits are there in the data sheet. I basically referenced it, put in my schematic, put in my layout. How wrong can it be? I was so wrong. This is where I also took time. For example, the temperature sensor did not work. And this is a big lesson that I learned. Whenever we are making a custom PCB, my advice or my learning point will be to always populate two PCBs. Why? Because if a component is not working on both PCBs or maybe three or four PCBs, it is highly likely a design error. Now, if a certain component or a part of the circuit is not working on one PCB, it is most likely a workmanship soldering or a component error, which is very specific to this errored PCB. I also had an error in the IR LED emitter circuit. It was not sending any infrared signals. After debugging for a few days, changing the resistor value and then even desoldering a new IR LED, I figured the error was in the NPN transistor. Now in my breadboard setup, the NPN transistor that I used was a TO92 package with pin one as the emitter, pin two as the base, and pin three as the collector. In my PCB, I simply replaced it with component BC817 SOT23 package. But as you see here, the pins one and two are being swapped between the base and the emitter. So again, the lesson here is to verify the schematic and the layout footprint and Please do not assume, even if it is as simple as an NPN transistor, that the pins and the layouts will be exactly the same between two components. No, no, please don't do that. Look at the data sheets for that new component, even though the functionality is exactly the same. One last thing is uh, maybe an optional note is to include some LEDs for TX, RX and power, especially once again for the first version of the custom PCB as they could be useful for debugging. So that was the general design considerations for a first version to create when we go from a breadboard prototype to a custom PCB. Now I took quite a long time to have a working prototype of PCB. And to be honest, in the midst of all the debugging, in the midst of weeks and months passing by, I was wondering whether I will even have the entire PCB working or what should be my next step. And I want to assure you that this is perfectly normal, especially, especially if you're working with a new microcontroller, 
a new component or a new circuit, a new design. So my learning point here will be to start small, small in terms of small number of new things and small number of subsystems, and then iterate onto creating a second version or even a newer design that can incorporate the components that worked before so that it keeps on working. After all, engineering is all about debugging and using abstractions to build more complex fun projects. So here's to all of us building small first version iterations and making it work so that we can all go on to building more fun projects. So thanks for watching and see you in the next video.